Well, I am thrilled to have with us today some special guests, and Trevor has been working with them very closely, so I've asked Trevor to come and make the proper introductions. So can you just welcome the best youth pastor in the United States of America yeah, that we're yeah. privileged to have on staff here, Reverend Trevor Wetzel. God bless you, Trevor. Thank you, Pastor. I'm the second best. No, I'm just teasing. I'm not any of those. I'm just a, a guy who just has an opportunity to spend time with teenagers and get to share into their lives, and they speak into mine as much as I speak into theirs. But today is special for me because, as most of you know, I'm totally into sports. Like, uh, I played sports in high school. I live and breathe sports. I can name probably every ESPN announcer since the began. ESPN began. I mean, I follow sports pretty closely. Zach and I have a competition. He probably knows a little bit more than me, but I wouldn't tell him that too many times. But it's an honor and a privilege today to have Jason Stumiller and also Vad Lee both here. They both currently are with FCA. Uh, Jason, of course, is the regional dire director of the FCA in this region, regional director in this area. Um, what an honor and a privilege it has been to meet Jason and to get to know him. Uh, you know, the first time I met him, you know, you don't know someone for the first time, you get to talking to him. He tells me, you know, he's reaching out to these school campuses and, and just seeing his heart for students uh, was awesome. And I was like, man, th this fella has got it going on and he's got the right, um, he's got the right attitude. He's not just doing it, promoting Jason, he's promoting Jesus. Jesus, amen? And I just really appreciate him. And of course, Vad, most of you who are here know that he played quarterback for James Madison, which I do season tickets every year. And it's an honor and a privilege for him to be here with us this morning. So as these two gentlemen come up this morning, I will let them tell you a little bit more about FCA, and then Vad's going to share about his own personal testimony. But would you please welcome my awesome friend, Jason Stu Miller. Amen. Thank you so much for having us. Well, my name is actually Vad Lee. I'm just kidding. I'm Jason with Valley FCA, and I want to just lay just a little bit of a foundation about what the Fellowship of Christian Athletes is about. I know everybody's excited to hear from Vad, but we're going to put me up here first, if that's okay. So FCA is a sports-specific ministry, and we're on the campuses, like Trevor had said, of our high schools, our middle schools, and the, our colleges. And the unique thing about FCA is we're a student-led ministry. So we empower our student leaders to basically evangelize their campuses for Jesus. And um, it's, it's a ministry that takes Jesus to the athletic fields, the courts, the pools, whatever, wherever there's an athletes, we're there. And it's, it's all about making Jesus famous. And um, it's about coaches, too, right? So a lot of times ministries or campus ministries or youth ministries, we are looking into how do we impact the lives of a, of a student, right? That's so important. But what we forget is that the coaches in society have more influence than maybe some of us parents do as well. Uh, Billy Graham once said that the coach will influence more lives for Jesus in one season than the average person will in a lifetime. So the coach has influence over the lives of whether it's a high school athlete, a middle school athlete, or even athletes in our community. So I'm, I'm super excited about what God's doing through FCA on our campuses. And um, just, uh, just know that as, as we partner with churches, as we partner with people in the community, God is going to be glorified. Jesus is going to be lifted up on our campuses through athletes. And um, one thing that I'm very excited about, I, I kind of twisted Vad's arm this, this semester about interning with us. And so we had the privilege to, to put Vad in front of many, many people. And uh, it stretched him. That's a good thing, right? <laughs> Amen. And uh, he is, I, I've just seen a tremendous growth in, in Vad alone. And uh, I'm so excited. But it's the, it's the influence of these coaches and athletes, right? So in today's society, sports is on a platform that maybe it shouldn't be, maybe it should, right? It, it's, it's almost a realm of entertainment. And our athletes and our coaches, when they take a stance for Jesus, they are influencing people in our communities. Am I right? Yeah. Yes. And so that is one of the, the hugest things that, that Vad and I have been working on with some of our other athletes and coaches is the influence that these athletes and coaches have in our community, whether it's young people, whether it's, it's older people, or whether it's just a sports fan in general. So we're going to hear a little bit more from Vad here in a second about what that looks like. So I thank you guys for the opportunity to, to share just, just our hearts for, for what Jesus is doing on these campuses. And um, I, I would like to acknowledge Wade and Maria Robinson. They are faithful board members, and they have done a, a, 
a great thing with FCA and, and lifting us up and, and being an encouragement with FCA. Amen. So now I'm going to get it out of the way, and we're going to make room for the guy that I call the man, Vad Lee. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for having me. Um, me and Jason has been on on this tour for a little bit. Been speaking at plenty of churches, and he say the same joke every time. So hi, I'm Vad Lee. Um, so I'm I'm the real Vad. Um, um, first, just thank you guys for allowing me to be here. Um, thanks for setting this up. Um, this truly is a blessing um, to be able to use um, the influence that the game of football um, kind of kind of brought to me and playing quarterback position, playing at GMU. Um, it's truly humbling um, just to be in this position, um, to, to, to stand right here where um, um, Pastor Trevor, um, and, 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 and Pastor Jeff stand, um, it's truly, it's truly amazing. And, um, I don't want this thing to be about me, um, while I'm up here. And for some reason, I'm a little nervous. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to pray. So please join me. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you so much, um, just for waking us up this morning. Um, been the best day of our life because it's the only one that, um, we're promised. Um, thank you so much for your influence in Jesus Christ. Um, thank you just for, for being here for us, allowing a place where we can come together, um, like-minded people and celebrate your name, praise and worship, and, um, and just speak truth into who you are and what you're about, um. God, um, just lift me up right now as I as I speak, um, and I pray that the message come from you and not from me. Um, thank you so much just for today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, so I was asked to come up here and talk a little bit about my life. Usually Jason is standing beside me, and um, I guess I'm nervous because sometimes I just wing this thing, um, but Pastor Trevor said, you got about 10 minutes, and that's a little past my wingspan, so um, <laughs> I, had to, I had to write some things down, um, so um, bear with me, but um, I'm going to just start from when I was young. When I was, when I was a little boy, um, I grew up in Durham, North Carolina, and that's about four hours from here. Didn't know anything about Harrisonburg or GMU, um, but I'll get to that later, um, but growing up, um, I, I got an older brother. He's seven years older than me, and um, he started playing football. And, and, and seeing him playing football, I knew that I wanted to become an athlete, and I wanted to be just like my older brother. Um, so it wasn't even, you know, I fell in love with the game. You know, I wanted, I seen it on TV or whatever. The power of influence, and I think um, Pastor Trevor will talk about this today when I'm done. Um, that's just the power of influence. My brother didn't tell me to go play. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't um, pull my leg to go play. I wanted to be just like my older brother, and um, and it's just amazing what you know the influence can do. Me being like my older brother now, other people looking at me and wanting to be like me, and it's just a it's just a it's just a cycle. But I grew early in the church. Um, in fact, if you go to my church at home in Durham, I go to a small, a small church, um, much smaller um, um, than this. And, and I don't know, it's probably about 50 people go to my church. And my name there, so my full name is Lavadier, and I say that for short because it's much easier, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, but I don't think they could get my name right. So um, they knew that I had a passion for God early on. I was one of those kids when praise and worship was on, I would, you know, shout maybe. I would um, act like I knew what I was talking about, but really I didn't. Um, and so my name there is Preacher Man, and that still is to this day. And I'm just so blessed by that because somebody seen something in me so young. And um, the pastor or whoever gave me that name, they seen something in me where uh, one day that I'm here now and I'm, I'm, I'm spreading the gospel through my influence. And that, that, was, that was inspired early when I was young. And my life is not perfect in the least. Um, um, I, got a, I got a father who, um, who's in prison. Uh, he's been in prison for a while now, and I, I just I really don't have an a intimate relationship. Um, but through God, through Jesus, we can, we can now talk on the phone, and he can call me, and, and we can have something in common and talk about God because now he's saved, and now um, through going prison and going through different things, you know, 
he know God now. And I, I just remember, you know, I could have been messed up. I remember um, times where I used to, me and my mom drive to the corner store, and I actually see my dad on the, on the, um, in front of the store just hanging out or whatever he was doing. And as um, soon as I would get out of the car, he would just take off running. And I didn't know, you know, as a, as a little kid, that's something that you can think is because of you. Like maybe, maybe um, you wasn't good enough or maybe, I don't know. I don't know what I did to him um, to make him run. Um, but he used to do that all the time. I used to see him all the time. And um, he was strung out on drugs and, and different things. And later he told me he didn't want me to see him like that, which, you know, I can, I can um, see his point on that. But um, it's, just, it's just amazing now. Because now he'll call me randomly, and um, and it's amazing how much I have grown in my faith. Because when he started calling me early, um, I didn't I didn't really want any parts of it. Um, I didn't you know I didn't know what to talk about. It was weird. Um, like you know you, you didn't have that intimate relationship. That's, that's kind of weird. But then um, just start getting in my word and growing in my faith. I now can talk about God to anybody, and I can I can talk about Jesus even if we don't have a relationship, and I think God would want it that way. Um, so I'm very thankful for that. Um, um, quick story about I, I started in Pop Warner, um, started playing running back, and um, I shared this story um, two weeks ago, um, but it was, it was a story that just, um, I came across the scripture in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, and it said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I reasoned like a child, um, um, I thought like a child, or when I became a man, I put away childish things. And um, I thought about the game of football and how it influenced me. And when I was young, I remember um, my team went, was, we were 14 and 0, we was in um, Orlando, Florida playing, playing for the national championship. And you got this little team from Durham, North Carolina, all the way in Orlando, Florida. And my parents still say it's the best time they ever had in their life. Again, influence. Um, and I remember that game, I ran a long touchdown. It was about 60 yards, and um, I ended up in the end zone. I looked back at the referee, and the referee said I stepped out of bounds. I was crushed. Um, so the game, later, the game kept going on, and I didn't score. And after the game, we ended up winning. And... Um, but you, if you would have looked at me, you would have thought we lost. Um, and I just remember me crying so bad and, like, going to my dad. and was like, man, I didn't score. Um, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't do anything this game. I, I wanted to really score. And then, you know, I thought about that now. And um, I thought about how selfish I was then and, you know, reasoning like a child, thinking like a child, and everything was about me. And um, now I kind of look and come to JMU and then getting hurt last year, understanding that it's – way bigger than me and understand that the same game that I, I was, you know, selfish about is the same game now I get to, to glorify God and let God be the hero and, and, and um, give Jesus all the glory, give God all the glory. Um, that, that's the same game that I was selfish about when I was young. And, and that's just the power of influence, the power of growth, um, and, and something that's truly a blessing just through the game. Um, when, so going to high school, um, Won a state championship there. I was the number one quarterback in the state. Um, and then I went to Georgia Tech. And if you don't know anything about Georgia Tech, um, Georgia Tech is, uh, their football is, is um, the quarterback is like a running back in their, in their offense. And um, me being an athlete, me being, having the ability to run, um, a lot of different people would tell me I wasn't good enough, would tell me that I couldn't play the position that I love, that I've been working hard my whole entire life for, um, telling me that I was not a quarterback. And, um, and, and that struck me the wrong way. And um, I was just out to prove everybody wrong. And um, if you want to get to my heart and, and really, like, <laughs> make me mad, tell me I'm not a quarterback because that's, that's what will, will make me thrive. Um, and so that's what made me choose going to, going to school at Georgia Tech, even knowing that that wasn't the place for me. And I just remember what God brought me to my knees one day, and, um, and I was just so upset. Um, I wanted to leave there, um, and I asked to leave. And um, my coach denied me from leaving my, my true freshman year. As soon as I got there, it was probably about two months. I was like, no, this is not for me. Um, and he denied me. And I just remember going, like, you know, thinking I didn't have any family in Atlanta, Georgia, so I was, I was by myself. And um, I just 
I, I feel like that's where my relationship with God really grew. Um, because that's the, that's the first time I remember him really bringing me to my knees and where I was so emotional and, um, kind of, kind of just like, man, I need you, God. And, and the whole time I was putting faith in the man. And when he denied, when my head coach denied me, that was a decision that, that was an emotional decision that I made going to my head coach and saying, you know, I want to leave. And so he denied me and I ended up staying two more years. And then my third year at Georgia Tech, I put my faith in God and I ran across, um, scriptures, Proverbs 3, 5, Jeremiah 29, 11, um, trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Um, Jeremiah 29, for I have plans for you not to prosper you, to prosper you and not to harm you um, for hope and, and, and a future. And I ran a, across scriptures like that, and I knew um, that God wanted me um, somewhere else. And finally, I felt released, and I felt, I felt good about it. And I was a starting quarterback at Georgia Tech, and, um, and JMU, was a special place um, ever since the first day I, I visited here. And I don't, I don't know what it is about this place, but for some reason I do not want to leave, uh, even now. And and right now I have the incredible opportunity to be in a, be a part of the NFL draft and hopefully get drafted at the end of this month. I'll find out something April 30th, uh, which is really exciting. Um, but yeah, it's just something about this place. I can't, I can't even describe it. It's something about this place that um, makes me feel like it's home. And um, I know before coming here, um, that God um, put over my heart that he was bringing me to Harrisonburg for more than just football. Um, yeah, he was bringing me to Harrisonburg for more than just football. And the sentence kind of ended there. I didn't know what that mean. And um, just going throughout my career here, I played two seasons. And last year, I played eight games. We were 7-0 and going into the eighth game. Um, we had college game day. Richmond um, came and, and, and spanked us a little bit. Um, and then I, that's the game I also got hurt. Um, and if I would just encourage anybody, I would just say um, give, give everything that you have. And you don't have to be a football player to have influence. Um, you can you can you can be whatever whatever your job is, whatever your title is, whatever your role is. Um, you have influence on others because you can't do nothing in life alone. And um, and I truly believe that. And because I got hurt my eighth game of the season, um, and I'm still in recovery. This is my last stage of recovery in my last month. Um, because I got hurt, you know, a lot of people were worried about me. A lot of people. Um, you know, wanted to check on me and make sure I was fine. And honestly, I was, I was good. Um, I know that God brought me to Harrisonburg for more than just football. And that's the message that I received before even coming here. So I didn't know what was going to happen or what, but uh, it's just truly amazing that I didn't end my career on football. I ended my career here in Harrisonburg spreading the gospel and um, using my influence to, to win others over to Christ. Um, that's just, I couldn't even write that any better. Um, I'm so blessed and honored to be in the position that I am now um, that even though I'm going for the NFL and um, that's just been a childhood dream of mine, but I know where I stand in Christ and I know that I'm not I'm, I'm not going to go to heaven for how many touchdown passes I throw or how many yards I throw. Um, I know it's going to be because of the relationships that I have with, with, with people on this earth, the relationship that I have with Christ, and how God is going to use me and, um, and continue to use me. So I'm truly blessed, and I know that, um, that taking the gospel to the field is sometimes not a popular thing. Uh, I don't know if you guys... Any of you men play football before, but that locker room can get nasty. Um, and not just the smell, but I'm talking about just the, the guys and <laughs> their mindset and everything. And, and honestly, I'm no different from, from those guys, but I have a relationship with Christ. And um, I know where I stand. So um, know where you stand. And for you young guys, know where you stand. And um, don't, let, don't let others um, take you off your track. Um, take you off your path that God has already created for you. Uh, because God has already wrote all of our story, and um, it's up to us to accept him in our heart. He cares about every little detail in our heart, in our life, um, every little thing. I mean, he know, the, he know the hairs on our head. Um, so I am truly blessed to let God use me and um, um, to really just enjoy this path that he has set for me. I'm truly in love, and God is my hero, and I'm so thankful for you guys um, allowing me to be here. Um, and, and FCA, a little bit about FCA. So FCA has influenced me tremendously. Um, that's, I think, 
you know, I, I've grown in my faith a lot, especially over this last semester. Um, and Jason was one of the first guys that I met um, when, I, when I came to Harrisonburg. When I came to Harrisonburg, I met Coach Withers, and then I met Jason um, because I knew that I wanted to set a standard the first day I got here. I didn't want to just be a football player. I wanted to, to make God's words true to me. Um, and um, Jason has been consistent um, throughout the last two years that I've been here. Um, he's been truly a blessing, one, because he take me out to eat and he pay. So <laughs> uh, that's the biggest blessing. <laughs> um, but, no, he's just been pouring into my life, challenging me um, in ways that I've never been challenged before. And, um, and truly it's just a, a relationship and partnership that I want to have with somebody else coming along. I, through that influence, that's another influence. He was an influence in me, and now I can influence other, other people. So, um, I'm just truly blessed um, to, to have this opportunity to speak in front of you guys. Um, and go Dukes, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Real quick, April 30th. If you guys would put that in your calendars, that is a day we need to be standing in prayer for Vad. That is the day that he may, he may go in the draft. And it's not what football or the NFL can do for Vad. It's what God can do through Vad for the NFL. So keep that, uh, keep that in your prayers, please. My name is Vad Lee, and I play quarterback for James Madison. I'm here, yeah, I can't even wear his shoes, they're way too big for me. Thank you, Vad, I really appreciate your testimony. It's awesome, it's awesome and it's amazing in itself, the fact, that, you know, when he was telling that testimony, wow, all the things you learn, you know, the stories you hear. But it's just an honor and a privilege to be in God's house today, right? Can we say amen? Uh, it's also an honor and privilege. I want to call out one of my friends here today. His name's Danny Brander. He and his wife, Erin, came this morning to hear me speak. And I just want to say thank you, Danny. Danny is one of my very best friends. We talk a lot. And let me tell you something. If you want to meet someone that can out-talk me, he's sitting right over there. We, we, we compete all the time uh, in who's talking more. And, and Pastor Jeff's over there smiling, going amen to that. Uh, I mean, I can wear it out, okay, on the phone, whether I'm with you, whether I'm not. And, and Danny, I love you and appreciate you. Uh, Danny's one of those guys that I met. Uh, he was uh, working for a company, and when I was working in sales, we connected, and immediately, literally the first time we really connected, it was like we, it was like we were long-lost friends connecting after years of being apart. It was just this connection. Uh, we can still, both of us can tell you exactly the place, and, the, and I just think it was a God moment. You know, we have those God moments of those people that we come in contact with, amen? Uh, f there are other people, obviously, in this church as well, but thank you for being here. I just wanna say thank you for that, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you and your wife here this morning. But if you would, let's all stand in reverence to the reading of God's word. Today, I titled my uh, sermon, Game Plan, uh, with a little help from the ladies, of course, they always help me out, and I appreciate Bonnie and Melinda as well for all the hard work they put into making Pastor Jeff and I look good. Uh, thank you for that, ladies. But um, we're going to be turning in the book of Matthew. It's probably been behind me, if I'm guessing correctly. But it's Matthew 20, 20 through 28, and I want to read that to you in your hearing, if you would. Uh, then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit on the right hand and at the other on the left in your kingdom. But Jesus an answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? They said to him, we are able. And he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on the right hand and on my left is not mine to give. But it is for those whom it is, pre it is prepared for by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, 
You know that the rulers of the Gentiles, uh, Lord is over them. And those who are great exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desire to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father, we're just so grateful, God, to be in your house. Father, I just sensed your presence here, God, this morning, even when I walked through the door. Lord, I pray, God, right now that your words, Lord, are spoken, God, today into our our church. God, ignite in us, Lord, a new fire, God, that will burn like a forest fire in our community, in our church, in our town, in our family, Lord. God, today I pray a special anointing upon my friend Vad, Lord, as he goes, and upon Jason as well as they lead us in FCA. Lord, be with them, God, as they go all over this earth, Lord, all over this nation. You know, Lord, whether it's through football or God, just speaking engagements, Lord, I just pray over both of them. Father, today, we ask you to bless this word, Lord, that comes forth, Lord, that it is in the hearing of the ones that are here, God. Bless the ones, God, that are out there on the, in the internet, Lord, that are listening in, God. Be with uh, Sister Diane and her mom and her, and her daughter, Lord, as they faithfully every, every week watch, Lord, we just praise you. And we honor you, Lord. Bless this, Lord. Bless our hearts. Bless our minds. Bless our lips. And we just give you praise and we give you honor. It's in Christ's name. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. Jesus is speaking here to the mother of James and John, who asked to allow her sons to have a spot uh, sitting at his right hand and his left hand in his kingdom. Pretty bold, wouldn't you think? Jesus being the wise wise teacher knowing they didn't truly fully understand what they were asking. In his rebuttal statement, he says, can you drink the cup I am going to drink? They, they answered and said, we can. Jesus says, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism uh, that I am baptized with. But to sit at the hand, right hand and on the left is not mine to give, but it's for those for whom is prepared It is prepared by my father. Then we see where the 10 other disciples get a little bit upset about that. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'd probably be a little jealous of that. You know, sometimes we get that way. But in typical Jesus fashion, he was in training mode. He was in teaching mode. He responded in his own perfect way in his words where he says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles, Lord is over them. And those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, What Jesus is talking about here is leadership. He's talking about leadership, but he's also giving a prophecy of what the disciples would encounter later on in life. The cup he is drinking and also the baptism which he is baptized with, uh, of course, he's speaking of the outpouring of the Spirit, but his cup that he's drinking is he is going to experience death in knowing, you know, who God is and the fact that he died for your sins on that wretched cross. He lost his life. Of course, he gained it back. Amen? We can stand in the, knowing that. In high school, I played football. I, and I know what some of you are thinking. <laughs> yeah, right. I didn't say I was good at it. I just said I played football in high school, right? Uh, But each week, every time we would prepare for a game, how many of you have ever played football know that Monday morning or Tuesday morning, what are you going to be doing? You're going to be watching the film of the team you're going to play the following week. How many times have you done that? Pastor Jeff played high school football. Uh, Some others have raised their hand. Van, I know you probably spent time in in the film room. In the NFL, they spend hours upon hours watching film, trying to determine, you know, how to beat another team, coming up with a game plan, coming up with strategy. Uh, Winning was their motivation, right? That's their motivation. And even in high school, strategically planning out an attempt to beat their opposition as a young young man growing up, uh, the model that I was always talked about in leadership, you know, even where I worked, no matter what I did, it was almost like leadership was a power position, right? 
I mean, I can remember, you know, uh, my mom was pretty bold and pretty much a power strip. You know, she was like, you're going to do what I say because I'm your mom, right? How many remember those conversations? But I think about, you know, even in leadership times, I remember having some bosses and some leaders that were, you know, over me. They would always say, uh, you, you, you're the leader. You need to set the example. You need to be the guy making all the decisions. You need to be screaming and yelling at everybody, right? I've heard that before, and that's, and that's what I always looked at as leadership. But the older I got, you know, I got a little more wise in that. Yeah, you still need to be the leader, uh, you know, and, and work from a position of leadership. But, you know, when you think about what Jesus said there, that's polar opposite of what he said being in leadership really means. I mean, yeah, well, you know, you kind of bounce back and forth. How many of you have a job where you know who the boss is, right? And you know if you... Shirley, you raised your hand. Does that mean Nelson's the boss? I think Shirley's the boss. But, 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 but think, think about this. I mean, you know, sometimes you go to work and, and there's this one boss, you know, if you do something wrong, what's going to happen, right? We've all had bosses like that. How many of you had a boss like that in your life? We know that something's going to come. We're going to be, oh, you did it wrong or whatever. But Jesus said, you know, the model that he said was he said, you're going to be a servant. You're going to be a slave. You're, gonna, you're not going to be the, the person working from a power position, so to speak. And that's why, and this isn't even in my notes, when Vad was speaking, he was saying that in a nutshell. It's what he was saying. He's saying, you know, I have this, uh, uh, you know, ability to be the quarterback. I'm in charge. And, you know, but, you know, and later on in my sermon, we'll touch on it again. But, you know, working from a, a, an influential standpoint. And, you know, when you think of your own life, does that way of leadership, you know, what kind of leadership style fits your profile? Am I serving, you know, am I serving to, to honor others? Am I serving, serving to lead others? Is my game plan in life to serve them? Or, uh, or is my style more the view of the normal process that we see in life? Because I've done both. I've done both. How many have done both? I've done both. And you know what happened? I failed at trying to be the head man in charge. I failed at it. I remember, you know, as a young man working in construction, thinking I'm in charge, they're gonna do what I say, right? They're gonna do, but you know what I found out later on in life? I had this uh, owner of a company I worked for named John Neff, and he would always come out and, and they would, we would have leadership classes and they would speak to us. And I can just remember him being so, so kind and so gentle. And I'm thinking, man, this is not normal. I mean, this guy's like being nice to me. I thought he would be yelling at me or something. You know, that's what I was always accustomed to. Can you relate to that any at all? But I just thought about that. I said, you know, um, he would come out and he would influence me in a way to realize that I would set the model. I would go out on a job site and my, I would have people that were kind of like over top of me. I'd go out to a job and they're like, man, you work harder than most of your guys do. You're, you're down there, you know, doing concrete work or, or you're driving a nail, whatever you're doing. You're the guy that's kind of doing the work and your guys are kind of just, you know, working less harder than you. And I said, you know, I was trying to lead from that position that Jesus spoke and I didn't even know it. You know, God was cultivating that in me. As Vad had said, in a, as a young man, it was being cultivated that way. When you think of the word influence, influence is the uh, capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone or something or the effect itself. In other words, influence affects character, development, and behavior. It does. It affects character, development, and behavior. John Maxwell said in his book, he said, leadership is influence. Nothing more and nothing less. Leadership is influence. And we, the word influence has came up a lot this morning. Amen. We heard that a lot from when Jason was speaking, when Vad was sharing. Influence. Leadership is influence. I know uh, when, I, when I speak to, you know, all of my leaders in our youth group, uh, the biggest thing I've, tr even currently, we're working on a way to influence students and empowering our leaders to be influencers over students, but not over them, but walk beside of them. You, you, you get the gist of what I'm saying. But empowering students to be leaders. As Jason said, FCA is an organization. Uh, you know, uh, Brooke Robinson, who uh, is normally sitting up here with us, she may be in Children's Church, but Brooke is one of the leaders at FCA. And, and, and I'm always encouraging her, you know, giving her pointers, hey, try this, try this, try this, in your development of leadership. Always sewing in, you know, development. I spend most of my time on leadership. I spend probably 50% of my day not every day, but 50% of my time I spend on developing leadership. I love leadership conferences. I love going to learn more about it. I want to be good at it. Amen. 
Our strategy here is to influence others to follow Christ in every aspect of their life. That is our goal. As a, as a church, as an individual, we want to influence others for Christ. Vad was speaking. He said, I want to inf- influence others. Yeah, I want to influence a kid to learn how to run the 40 quicker. I want to influence a, a guy to know how to throw the ball a little further. I wanna, but I also want to influence them to know Jesus. I want to influence things in their life that would reflect Christ. Amen? And as a business professional, I can remember planning out my day. How many of you plan out your day? When I would go to the office, I would plan out my day. My week, in some cases, we would plan it out. If we knew we had a lot of work coming up, we would plan it out. Or even the yearly planning. We would sit down as a business before I came to church. Uh, Even now, we sit down and look at things here at church. But just speaking of my, before I came here, uh, working for Rockingham Ready Mix, one of the things we would do, we would sit down and talk about what's the year look like? What do we need to do as of this date? What do we need to do as of this date? We would plan it out, the growth. Just like in football or any other sport or even in our business and even in life, you have to have a game plan to be successful. You have to have a strategy, something laid out before you to be successful. How many of you agree with that? I mean, Russell runs a business. If he doesn't have any kind of strategy or, and, and his strategy may look different than mine, his strategic plan may be, you know, sitting on his desk, scribbled on a, on a napkin or a piece of paper, but there's still strategy involved in that. Amen. I know Terry works as someone who, who is like an operations manager working for his dad. And one of the things he does is he schedules people. Can you imagine, Terry, if you never put a plan together? It would be chaos, confusion, nothing would ever get done. Am I right? And he's smiling because it's true. And and I just think about that even in my personal life. When I think of a game plan, there are several things I like to consider. Okay, first of all, what is the game plan? What is my direction? What is the game plan? I sit down and I go, what is the game? When, When we go to work each day or we walk out, you know, onto the school campuses, Simply being around our neighborhood, how many, you know, you live in a neighborhood of, of other people. Do we have a game plan on how to reach people? If we, if we sit down and went, man, I really need to reach this person. Uh, I really need to reach that person. How could we make a difference in someone's life? And this is a true story. Uh, and I've told you this story before, but there may be someone here that's never heard it. One of my neighbors would never talk to me. Never, ever, ever would I get two words out of this guy. Nothing. And my, and my wife will say, he's right. And one year, a couple years ago, it was snowing really bad. And how many of you know we hate when it snows real bad because you got to snow blow and scrape and shovel and get all the snow out of the way, right? So I'm one of those early birds. I'm up at like five o'clock in the morning. I'm out on the driveway and I'm, I'm a beast. I'm going at it, right? And I get down to the bottom of my driveway and I'm thinking, you know what? I'm going to snow blow my neighbor's driveway. And I went over and my driveway, my neighbor's driveway is 300 feet long. It's not five feet long. It's 300 feet long. So I blow out the big entrance part of his driveway. I was pretty hot and tired by this time, but I snow blowed it out. It's amazing how from that moment on, our relationship totally changed. How we now have conversations about church. We now have conversations about, you know, other things. And, and where before there was no, com- no communication whatsoever. There was an influence in that moment, amen? Just a time where I felt like God spoke to me and said, you need to do this, and I just, I was, I was obedient, and I did it. What is the game plan? How can we make a difference in someone's life? How can we reach someone? The two disciples that in this scripture here that, that we're talking about, James and John, they were two brothers who were fishermen. They were two of the three, along with Peter, who went up on a high mountain with Jesus. If you remember that story, uh, when Jesus, actually his appearance changed. It said, his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. It's where they saw Moses, they saw Elijah, if you remember that story. And they heard God speak from heaven, this is my beloved son and who I am well pleased. Later on in scripture in Matthew 17, it reads, um, it says, now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them saying, he said, tell this vision to no one until the son of man is risen from the dead. Don't, Don't tell anyone. He had a plan. Jesus had a plan in place. He was thinking, you know, God's perfect plan. He said, I'm fulfilling God's plan. How many of you, we know Jesus knew the plan. He was, when he was walking, when he stood before Pontius Pilate and they were going to kill him, what does it say that he spoke? What did he say? He said nothing. He didn't speak anything. Oh, he said a few words. He says, I am who you say that I am. But he didn't stand up there and go, oh, please don't do this to me. I didn't do anything wrong. He just stood there and he bore 
the sins of the world through his tragic death, amen? And of course, in his glorious resurrection, we all receive uh, salvation through him. John 3, 16 and 17, here's what it says, and we all know it. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's the plan, right? So God had this plan laid out for Jesus that we would be saved, not to condemn us, but to save us, amen? Jesus did not come here to live in this big house on the hill or drive the nicest car. You're like, wait a second, they didn't have cars then. But you know what I'm, getting, I'm saying, right? You understand, he did not go to what earthly fleshly desires, right? His life had purpose, it was perfect. He had direction, he had a vision, and his influence, even here on these 12 men, he had a huge influence on their lives. You know, uh, and here we have James and John especially, he was speaking to them. Think about this, and, and you've heard this term many, many times, I know you have. But where there is no vision, the people perish, and that's in Proverbs. Where there is no vision, how many times have we used that to describe, you know, we'll see something and say, where there's no vision, we, we just use it as a punchline, right? But it's true. If we don't have some kind of vision, even in our personal lives, we've got to have direction. We've got to have a vision. We've got to know where God's taking us, right? How many of you would say, you know, even in yourself, think about, you know, where is God taking me? Have you, have you talked to him about it? And said, God, where are we heading with this? Where are we going? And, you know, I love it when people say to me, well, this is what God said to me. This is what I'm going to do because God's speaking this into my heart. And I believe it with all my heart that God spoke this to me. How many times do we say, oh, our pastors, you know, we don't have vision. Maybe we forgot or, or, or you know, sometimes we'll talk about our, our bosses. They don't have vision when in reality they see the big picture, right? Come on, church, when it's in reality, Scripture gives us a game plan for our own lives. Proverbs, in NI, if you read the NIV version, it says where there is no revelation. Where there is no revelation. I want a revelation. I want to hear from God. I want to know, God, what is your plan? You know, when, bad, you know, when you're going, what is, God, give me the plan. I want to know. I want to know. I don't know about you, but I want to know all the details. Even though you may not believe that, some of the leaders that work with me are like, you don't need to know all the details. You just let us take care of it. But I still want to know the details. I'm, I'm like, God, give me a vision. Give me a, give me a revelation. Without a game plan, people will perish. See, that's the alternative. People will perish into an outer darkness, into a place of gnashing of teeth, into an eternal bliss without knowing God, with no hope of redemption. We were talking in our Sunday school class this morning. I said that when, when, if you miss heaven, it's not so much, you know, you think about, oh man, I missed, I missed heaven. I don't get to hang out in heaven. But the, the sad part is, is you're separated from God. That is the worst thing. It's not, you know, you, you, yeah, you're going to miss heaven and the, and the streets are gold and it's an awesome place. You can get a big house and all that stuff. That's, the, that's just the bonus. The fact that you get to spend eternity with Jesus is the, is the milestone. That's what we're reaching for. It's not the big house or the crown. It's, it's being able to spend our, our days in the, with Jesus, amen? And, and I just, sometimes we miss that. Our game plan has to match our play or we will fail, we'll fail God and we'll also, but most importantly, we could fail others. I love it. I love it when people say, I got this friend and, you know, I've been talking to him and, and you know, I've been talking to him for a while and, and, and they received Jesus, you know, the other day. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story, and this is not in my notes. The other day, a friend of mine, um, his name is Neil, and he, he goes to Potter's house uh, with Jason. And we were out uh, working at, on a concrete job uh, on my day off. Uh, obviously, I was working, but that's just how my brain works. And we were working, and th this concrete driver pulls in. His name, uh, his name is Richard, and I know him. And as Richard, Richard was filling up the wheelbarrow, and I was pushing five yards of concrete in a wheelbarrow. Notice I said I pushed it, okay? And, and it was a long distance, and Russell and Terry can tell you that is not easy. Nothing in concrete is easy, but to push five yards in a wheelbarrow uh, 100 feet and dump it and come back was a lot of work. In between each load, I'd go back and say, hey, Richard, how are you doing? You know, we were talking. I was like, I said, Richard, did you know that uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior? And I went back. And then I came out the second time. I said, I said, did you know that God, for God so loved the world, and he gave his only begotten son, and whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have eternal life? And I came back and said, Apostle Paul said that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Every time I'm going back and I'm saying this to him, 
And he's like, man, this guy's lost it. I said, Richard, when I worked there, I didn't get to witness to you, but I don't work there now and I'm gonna say whatever I want because you're on my job site and I'm gonna say whatever I want, right? So I'm sitting there talking to him and the last thing I said to him, and Danny, you know Richard, you know what I'm talking about, he's truck 201. And if you know him, Richard's really quiet. And he's smi- they call him Smiley because when he, he smiles a lot, but he's a great guy. He's a great guy. And I said, do you know Jesus? Do-? I said, you know, Richard, if, if you were to die today, do you know if heaven would be your home? He said, I don't know. I said, that's why all you have to do is ask Jesus to come into your heart and you're saved. I said, it's as simple as saying, Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me in your blood. And guess what, folks? It's done. It's done. He will have eternal life. And that's all he has to do is ask for eternal life. Amen? I want to tell this story because I thought it was a good one. I don't like to just have a sermon of stories, but it seems like they're coming along. There was a shoe uh, company, and I told this to the youth, who sent out two salesmen in a remote part of Africa. They were attempting to move uh, their brand of shoe into this region of the world. They really didn't have any sales there. And after after several, several days of traveling around that region, the first salesman came back and said, this is sad news. There's no prospects here. No one here wears shoes. He said, everyone's barefoot. No one's wearing shoes. A couple of hours go by. The second salesman comes back and he says, he was really excited. He said, guess what I found? The market is, the potential was awesome. Nobody's wearing shoes. He was like, everybody needs a pair of shoes. You see the perspective difference. The per, it's totally in the perspective. You know, when I was talking to my friend Richard the other day, all I was trying to do is influence him with the gospel. I, I cannot save him. You cannot save anyone. How many here knows that? But just by speaking words, saying, you know, Jesus, I mean, Richard, God will give you, etern- Jesus will give you eternal life. All you have to do is ask him. All you have to do is say, it's a free gift. He doesn't charge anything. How many of you know Jesus still gives it away for free? Amen. It's a free gift. You can't do anything to earn it. You don't deserve it. None of us deserve it. Our wretched sins, we don't deserve it. But Jesus is faithful and just, right? He'll forgive you of all of your sins, right? Amen. Our success is measured by how much our game plan matches the vision. You know, we have to have a vision. We have to have a game plan and our success will be measured by that. If, if, you know, I look at a business, you know, I've looked at business, uh, you know, um, I know Danny and I, we talk business a little bit from time to time. I've talked to other folks, how they, how they set up their business model and just looking at different models and they're all a little different, right? But you have to have a plan. You have to have a plan. You have to have a strategy. You have to have some kind of plan in place and in football, especially. I, I mean, you know, uh, if, if JMU went out on the field with no plan, I mean, yeah, I mean, Vad's an awesome quarterback. But can you imagine, Vad, if, if you had no game plan and you're out there, you know, I'm not sure where that defensive back's going to be when I release the ball. I know he's out there, but I didn't watch any film. I really didn't have a plan. Uh, I don't know if they're playing a 5-2 defense or if they're playing a 3-4. I, I just don't know. Can you imagine what the results would be? Because let me tell you, at the college level, and especially at the next level, everybody's good. Everybody, as Vad was telling me, we met the other day, he said at the college level when he went to Georgia Tech, he said everybody won a state championship. It wasn't just one guy winning it, everybody won it. You know, at the high school level, it's a little different, but can you imagine not having a plan in place? God places you exactly where he wants you to be. God, God puts you right where he wants you to be. Be directional. Be intentional when you pursue others for God. Be intentional and be directional. You're like, what? You mean I? Be intentional? I'm intentionally. When I was, the other day when I was out there on that job, I intentionally and directionally waited till Richard and I were like one-on-one there. And I was like talking to him about God. I was talking to him about Christ. And I see Shirley, she's smiling because she knows it's all about that, isn't it not, Shirley? One of the greatest gifts that you could ever offer someone is salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That's the greatest gift you could ever give them because it's eternal and it's everlasting. 
I could give you the keys of any Mercedes. I could give you the keys of, of a Lamborghini. And guess what? All those things will pass away, but his word will remain. Jesus will remain forever in eternity. And when, when I get to heaven, I cannot wait. I'll be able to outrun Vad. No, I'm just, I, I mean, you know, things in heaven are gonna be, it's gonna be amazing. We're gonna be standing with Jesus and it's gonna be glorious. And we're gonna be able to sing, Sharon, I'm gonna be able to sing. You'll be in trouble as our, I will be able to finally sing, amen? And, and my wife's like, amen, I don't like hearing, no, I'm just teasing. You will never influence the world. One of the statements I like to make, you'll never influence the world trying to be like the world. You'll never influence the world trying to look like or identify yourself with that. And, and I'll say this, and I wanna be careful how I say this, but, but I think I need to say it. You know, I go to ministers' retreats. I go to youth minister retreats. I go to leadership training. And it's always amazing to me how everybody looks the same. They dress the same. They act. Come on now. If Victoria was here, she'd be like, yep, he's right. Pastor Jeff knows when the youth group kids, I mean, when all the youth pastors walk into district council, they pretty much all look the same, don't they, Pastor? They, they, they mimic the person who's in charge. They look, I mean, I love John May. I mean, John May's a great guy, but it's amazing how many people mimic and, and walk and talk and act like John. He has influence over them. He has influence over them. Did you hear me? You have influence over them. You may not know it, but when you're intentional, when you're directional, when you have a story to tell, you have influence over them. And when you have the gospel, you have even greater influence over them because the word will not come back void. That is scriptural and I'm gonna stand on that. See, uh, it, it, there, there's no, well, I'm gonna take some of the Bible and use it, but not all of it. I believe all of it from beginning to end. When, when Jesus says by, when, when it says in scripture that by his stripes we are healed, when we prayed for Sherry Dixon the other day, I truly believed that that moment healing was gonna take place. And when she started texting me at 5.30 in the morning yesterday, I'm thinking, oh man, God is up to something awesome here. I mean, she's already talking about coming home. Are you kidding me? She went through like a, what was it, eight hour surgery and you know, had a mass on her brain. I mean, it's, uh, when, when I first found out about it, Pastor Jeff and I immediately, immediately we started praying. As soon as it happened, I said, Pastor, will you please come to my office? I got something I want to share with you. I got something I want to pray about. And we started talking and we, and we started praying. The second thing, and Vad mentioned this, it's amazing, brother, how you were hitting on stuff. We're playing for something higher than ourselves. And in the movie tonight, I want you to come back. I'm telling you, you're going to be changed. You're like, yeah, but movies aren't my thing. Let me tell you, I've watched movies. Uh, we were talking about Sister Green and I were talking about it before church. Back in the day, Christian music movies were kind of, you know, a little bit low scale, low budget. You know, they were a little bit boring, right? Uh, but I, the movies of today are powerful. People are praying over these movies. You know, War Room was a powerful movie. And I believe Woodlawn's got that same power. It's reaching a different group. It's reaching a, a sports related group. And let me tell you, it's a big group. It is a big group. When Vad says, uh, made the comment about locker rooms are different, trust me, they are different. They're, they're totally different. I, I, I am a high school basketball official and sometimes they will stick us over in the corner of, of a locker room, like in a room attached to the locker room. We hear what the kids are saying. We hear what the players are talking about. We hear everything, right? And we're just sitting in there shaking our head, laughing, saying they're so crazy, you know. But it's just amazing to me, you know, God is up to something good, but it, we're not playing, we're not playing for ourselves, we're playing for something higher than ourselves. Something that, the, there's a purpose in that. We gotta, we need to have purpose in our, our, our walk with the Lord and when we go out and we share the gospel to others and when we, when we build on influence, we gotta understand it's not about us. It's really not. In Matthew 16, 24 through 28, it says, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Now, that, that's not American, is it? Isn't that non-American? Isn't it in America, uh, it's all about me, right? I wanna take care of myself. He says, and take up his cross and follow me, and whosoever desires to save his life will lose it. If you desire to save your life, you'll probably lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, you will find it. You will find it. For what profit is it for a man to gain the whole world and to lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his own soul? What would you give in exchange for your soul? We were talking in Sunday school uh, this morning, and, and I was like, ask most people in America, what, if you could ask for one thing, what would it be? 
What would be one thing you would love to have? You're like, man, one thing. Just think about it for a minute. Think of one thing you'd love to have. I'm thinking, man, I want a million dollars, right? Or I want a new car. I want a new house. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things because all of us want a new car, right? Put that in the budget next year, Pastor Jeff. I'm just teasing. I'm just, I'm just kidding. But, but think about it. Everybody, you know, but I said, you know, to me, I probably want that. But to somebody who's maybe sick, or somebody like Sherry, who's, you know, going through this procedure, and they want health. They want health. Here's the news. Here's the good news. Jesus gives us eternal health. He gives us health that will be everlasting and everlasting and everlasting. It never goes away. Once we reach the other side, it's not, it never ends. And, and there'll be no sickness, there'll be no sorrow, there'll be no, you know, all of the, no sin, all those things will be washed away. And we'll get to walk on streets of gold, we'll be in heaven. I mean, I just can't wait. I don't know about you, but it's the blessed hope of making it to heaven. Amen? Yes. Anybody, everybody still with me? Are we, are we falling asleep yet? Check me, check me at the door, okay? Jesus was talking here, he says to deny yourself. Being willing to give up maybe everything. There are people on this world, in this world, who are dying for the gospel every day. We in America have not seen that type of, we, we say, you know, we're oppressed, we're, but, but we, we really don't know. When you go to other countries and people are, are losing their lives for the sake of the gospel, people are being thrown into jail for the sake of the gospel, that's taking, that's going all in. That's going all in, but there's influence in that. There is such influence. Uh, we, we, we heard Jeannie Mayo speaking. If you ever get an opportunity, go to her website, JeannieMayo.com, and look up this story. But she was telling about don't go on the ice. It's a story about these, these uh, men uh, back in, I don't even remember all, all the story, but basically they were told to go out on this ice. They stripped them of all their clothes. And they said, you have to go on this ice, this big pond of ice, and you have to stand there until, and basically with no clothes on until you die. Unless you denounce Christ. If you denounce, denounce Christ, you can come off the ice and you can come over to a fire and eat and you can have a merry time. And it talks about the story of how each one of them slowly, they would hear a thud in the ice one by one. And this is a story that my kids in our youth group that were there in Orlando a few years ago still talk about this story because it influenced and impacted them that greatly. Eventually it comes down to the last one or like somebody yells, come off the ice, come off the ice. Eventually, the man passed away, fell over. And one of the soldiers was so impacted and so influenced, he took off his clothes and he ran out on the ice and says, I want Jesus. If that man's willing to give up his life for Jesus Christ, I'm willing to receive him into my heart because he knew that there was something about someone that would be willing to give up and lose everything just to gain heaven, amen? Just for the fact that Jesus Christ was our Lord and Savior. It's not about you. It's not. It's about, it's all about him in you. It's all about what God is going to do in and through you. Philippians 1.21, it says, for, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I was, I heard a song about that this week and I was like, well, I love this song. And I almost played it. I was like, I almost brought it as an illustration. Matthew 20, Jesus said, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. These same disciples who were with him during his earthly ministry, these same 12 that walked around with him, all ex with the exception of one, lost their life. They, were, they lost their lives for the gospel. They, they were all in, amen? They were all in. They were sold out to the gospel. They saw the things that Jesus did. They saw the miracles that were, were happening. They saw changes in people, Amen? That's the story that you can offer. These are the things that we can offer. We can't, remember when, when was it Peter that still said silver and gold, I, I don't have, but what I give unto you in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And the man who was, was crippled got up and ran and walked. I don't know about you, but someone who's, who's, who can't walk and you give, that's what God offers. He offers eternal life. If someone's on their way you know, to, to hell, if someone is a sinner and lost and they have no, no savior to, to look to, you, you have the greatest gift. You have something to offer. You have eternal life through Jesus Christ. Sometimes, sometimes what the world sees as a loss, our God sees as a victory, Amen. What the world sees as a loss, they're like, man, that guy lost his life. 
But there's victory in that, amen? There's influence and victory in that. I may lose my life, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna obtain it when I walk on that street of gold. And Jesus says, welcome in that good and faithful ser servant. Welcome into the joys of the Lord. Amen? What man sees as failure, God sees as opportunity. And my last point is, is am I an influencer? Am I the influencer? Am I? Let me give you a couple points and then we're, then we're done. When I think of uh, influence, obviously I think of Jesus. I think of Elijah, uh, you know, his leadership and influence with Elisha. I think of Moses and Joshua. You know, I think of, uh, you know, uh, Paul, the apostle Paul, his influence on the churches, you know, there. And I just, I just think of all those influences. Um, you know, when I read this book, um, you know, John Maxwell, it was the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. Uh, he talks in there about a story, and I think Victoria and I, and I maybe see on a few of the young adults, we've been studying this book. Uh, there was a guy named Jim Senegal. Senegal, I think he was the co-founder of Costco. How he was so influential in his employees, how uh, when he started some of his, and you know, Costco's are everywhere, right? It's a, a huge company. They do very, very well financially. Uh, they also, I did not know this statistic, but they have one of the highest pay scales uh, of any retail store, and they have the best benefits of retail sales in America. And I was like, wow, that's pretty powerful. And they're always busy when you go in Costco. It's like a flood of people in there, you know, buying things. But he, he had an employee who was like a manager of one of his stores in California. He was in like Arkansas or somewhere, and he got on a plane and flew all the way to California just to, to spend time with his manager, uh, to, to have a word with him before he went into his surgery, uh, did things like that, but he believed in people. He was an influencer. He was, he was sowing into people, you know, what God had blessed him with. And, and just seeing that, that transformation, you know, even in his business world, when we're living our lives for the Lord, is our attempt to influence out of our own desires or is it from a godly perspective? I would ask you that question. When you think about influence, are you, are you really thinking about, well, I want to get this done and I want to get that done and I want it to be, happen because it's my idea? Or are we thinking, God, how would you want me to get this done? How can, this, how can I do this in a way that will, will influence someone for Jesus? Even though I was pushing the wheelbarrow the other day and it was hard work, the entire time I was thinking about his soul as much as I was thinking about getting that concrete done. I was thinking about my brother standing there because you know what? If he were to die and not know Christ, I wouldn't see him in heaven. And that's the, I don't want that, I don't want, I don't want to walk into heaven and go, and God say, Trevor, he was right there. He was right there in front of you. You could have influenced him. You could have had an influence on his life. Our influence can build others up or in some ways we can tear down what God is doing in others. I've been guilty of that. How many, how many can agree with that? Sometimes I, I identify, um, you know, Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us, not Trevor died for you. It says Christ died for us, not, you know, put your name in there, died for anyone. So do I have the authority to judge someone else? Do I have the authority to lead someone I didn't hang on that cross. God didn't give me the authority to do that. Or, do, or, you know, he gives us scripture. He gives us wisdom in scripture. He gives us the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom. When we call upon his name, he gives us the boldness to share this hope to everyone. You know, when you're putting your game plan together, God is standing, as Pastor Jeff preached on the, the Holy Spirit last week, God has indwelled in you this Spirit of God that will give you that boldness to speak out. When Vad said he was a little nervous, guess what? Pastor Jeff will tell you, even today after 40 years and 39 plus years in ministry, it still gets a little intimidating. You get up in front of a group of pastors and try to preach, that can get intimidating for someone that hasn't been, not been doing it long. My high school football coach, when I was in high school, and I'm going to close as our praise team comes up. My high school coach, his name was Gary Smith. When I was in high school, and my sister-in-law, Teresa, my wife, Trina, I'm trying to think who else in here, maybe Dinah, some of you guys knew. I was the meanest kid in school. If you knew me in school, no joke. I'm not kidding. I, was, I, had, I saw the principal's office more times than I saw the bathroom. 
And, and I'm not exaggerating. I, I would get in trouble for, I put gum in a kid's hair one time just because I could. I tied, a, I tied a, uh, a, a power cord around a kid's belt loop one day and a teacher called him up to the front. Um, true story, I tied my wife's hands and feet behind her back in band and she got in trouble. True story. I got set in front of the, the I mean, the list, it's, it's, Pastor Jeff, it's this little, I mean, I can't tell you all the things. My, they had to, they used my, uh, my fo folder for a w paperweight for everyone else's. I mean, it was r ridiculous. And I was just immature and stupid. That's just what it was. I mean, I just use that term loosely. But when I, when I played football, as, as most of you guys that played football, there's a discipline that comes along with being in sports. And there's a respect and a discipline. And if you did something out of line, you know what our coach did? Run the hill. And anybody that grew up in Franklin knows there's a lot of hills in Franklin. Let me tell you. Run that hill. And I'm like, oh, not again. But, but we would run that hill. One time we had a kid who put toilet paper in the in the commode too much of it, and the whole team had to run the hill because he wouldn't tell who did it. All right, so everybody got in trouble. But, but I was in trouble a lot, and I played football my junior year in high school, and one day after football season, I went into the, the coach had called me into the office. I'd done something. It wasn't bad. This time it was actually not a terrible thing. It was a, something silly maybe. And he set me down in his chair, and he shut his door, and he said, Trevor, I've seen a change in you this year. He said, you've changed a lot. You're not getting into trouble. Your portfolio has went to nothing. You're never in trouble anymore. He said, I believe that football has really helped you in that. And you know what? It's true. He was not lying. There was an influence on my life because somebody had to reel me in, and it was him. Because if, I wouldn't, if he wouldn't have reeled me in, guess where I would have been? I'd have been up on that hill above that chicken house running up and down the hill until my legs fell off or I would have been off the team. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to quit. There was no quit in that, you know, and, and I just think back of times and moments of influence in my own personal life. And, and I think about even the time when, when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit for the first time, the influence that it had in my life. Now, I, I, I don't know, you know, who needs to hear this. I don't know if it's something, that, you know, that maybe you don't even think about. You know, when you realize that that our influence and our leadership determine, you know, is determined service, then we will execute the perfect game plan. And my point there is, is when you realize your influence, you can execute a great, per uh, you can execute a perfect game plan. When, when, when Vad realized, I'm the quarterback. When, when, you know, Abdullah, is that his name? Abdullah, the running back is the runner. The game, game, game plan's in, in effect, Right. When the offensive linemen realize that, that their perfect spot is right where they're at, the position that they've been placed in, come on now. When we start to realize as individuals that God has placed us in the position that he wants us to play, he, he said, I'm going to put you right there. And sometimes I'm the guy that goes, oh, man, I start complaining. Come on now. Come on, church. I start complaining. This isn't right. I, and, and I'm the first one to complain. I'm a, I'm a whiner. I mean, sometimes I whine. You ask my wife. Sometimes I'm terrible. But in reality, God is saying that I have the perfect plan, Trevor. Stop looking at yourself. Stop looking in the mirror. Stop worrying about whether you scored. And, and just remember that the part of the plan that you're helping to execute is this plan. Not that one over there that's selfish in its own, but this plan right here. I put you there for a reason. So I want you to even, as we close, I want everyone, if you would, to bow your heads and I'm going to just talk a moment with you. This is, may not be a salvation message to many of you, but I still want to ask you before you walk out of here. Jesus Christ gave up his life. He gave up his life for the ransom of many. And when I, when I, when I get on my knees before God and I say, God, you're so awesome. Thank you, God, for giving me the opportunity, Lord, to be where I am in life. If you're here today and you would say, you know, I've never taken that time to really acknowledge to Christ that I want to receive him into my heart. Maybe you're going through a struggle and you're like, I don't know where to turn. I don't know what direction. My game plan's all messed up. 
Jesus already has that game plan written out. And he's got your name jotted in there. He's like, right here. If that's you this morning, you'd say, you know, I need to receive Jesus this morning. I, I feel like that, you know, maybe my life doesn't reflect what he has planned for me. If that's you, I just want you to slip your hand up. I'm not going to call you up front. I'm not going to embarrass you. I want to love you. I want you to know that Jesus loves you. Even right now, I just sense that God is speaking to a few folks here this morning. If that's you, and you would say, I need Jesus in my life. Slip your hand up real momentarily and then put it back down so that we can pray for you. Jesus loves you. Maybe if you're here this morning and you'd say, you know what, Pastor Trevor, my game plan is a, is a wreck. I've, I've been walking around defeated. I've been walking around, my, my record's 0 and 12. I feel like that my game plan is so tragic, I don't even know what to do. I need a new plan. I want a new plan. I want to know where God's taking me. I want to know where God's placing me. I want to know what, you know, the plans that he has for me as Jeremiah 29, 11 states. I want to know that revelation that God has placed, you know, has already written out. I want to know it. And I want you to pray with me that God would reveal it to me. If that's you, I want you to slip your hand up. Many hands are going up. Hands are going up all over. Lord God, today, Father, I just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, to be here. Father, I thank you for the many hands that went up this morning, God, that we're looking for a revelation, Lord. We're looking for a purpose, God. We're looking for the perfect plan, Lord, laid out, God, for us. Father, you've placed us in these positions, God. Now, God, you want us to execute your perfect will. Lord, I would pray right now, God, against anything that would come against the plan, the vision, God, which you have placed. God, I know that's speaking to someone here. I know it is, God. Don't let me be the stumbling block, Lord. Don't let me be the one that, that would hinder, God, what you're trying to do, Lord. But let me be a facilitator, Lord, of your will, God. Father, this morning, God, for, for our brother Vad and, and Jason, Lord, for all that they do in your kingdom, God, Lord, I pray a special anointing up on Jason. God is our leader, Lord. What a great friend he is, Lord. I pray that, Lord, you just use him in a mighty way, God, to reach the many souls. Lord, the influence that he's had on Vad's life, Lord, I just, God, thank you for placing him there. God, I pray over Vad, Lord, as you use him, God, for your glory, God, throughout wherever you take him, Lord. If it's the NFL, Lord, I pray that, Lord, that, that, a, that a revival break out in his locker room, Lord, and you lead him, and God, and give him wisdom, God, and give him boldness. Let him share his testimony, Lord. Let that platform grow, Lord, not for his glory, but for your glory, Jesus. Father, go with him, Lord. Go with both of these men, Lord. Father, go with every individual that's here this morning. As we pray for clarity, Lord, in our direction, Lord, Lord, also, if there's someone here, God, that needs to know you, Lord, that before they walk out of here, they would ask you to come into their hearts. Lord, we need you, Lord. And Father, we don't want anyone to, to slip into eternity and not know you. Lord, give us a boldness that we go home today and we start writing down a game plan. We start saying, God, this girl in my, in my office, Lord, needs to know you. How can I execute the perfect plan, game plan to influence her? Lord, this, this kid that sits next to me in my Spanish class or in my math class or, or in history, God, how can, I, how can I reach them, God? How can I influence their life where they know Jesus, Lord? And Father, that, that, that anointing just fall and the power of God just fall. Lord, how can I execute the perfect plan, Lord, with maybe an employee, God, that is working beneath me, Lord? How that can walk beside of them and put my arm around them and show them your love. Lord, how can I reach out to teammates, God? How can I reach other students, God, in my youth group, God, in my youth ministry? How can I reach teachers? How can I be a servant to the one above me? Lord, just give us clarity, Lord. God, I pray 
that you lead us and guide us as we leave this place today. We offer honor and praise to you, Jesus. And we just, we want clarity from you. Lord, speak into the minds now. Holy Spirit, begin to speak even right now in our minds. Renew us. Renew our minds. Your scripture says it is a renewing of our mind, Lord. I thank you, God, for all that you're doing and what is being accomplished here this morning. It's in your matchless name we pray and all of God's children said, amen.